I have a story of potential hauntings from my mum, dad and brother. They're all kind of interesting. However, I wasn't present for any of these events, so cannot confirm their validity or if they've been exaggerated. They get pretty wild. However, they're interesting nonetheless, so I'll give it a go. So first off, my mum's story. So this occurred before I was born, when my brother was about seven years old, although he's not really involved in the story. My mum lived in a different town than where I grew up. She had a friend called Pat, I believe, who had a husband called Billy. She had known them for years as she used to work with Pat, and when they were looking for a new house, she advised the one next to her which was up for rent at the time. It was an attached house with my mum, dad and brother on one side, and Pat and her husband on the other. Apparently, within the first few weeks of living there, Billy became incredibly irritable losing his temper over the most minor of things, and after several months became physically violent. It got to a point where Pat had a secret knock she used on the wall, as the two rooms were literally through the wall from each other, to signify that Bill was hurting her and for my mum or dad to come around straight away, which would instantly calm Billy down and make Pat feel more secure. While all this was going on, Pat also mentioned that whenever she and Billy went out for the day, they would come home to a completely ransacked house, with the furniture tipped over and the cupboard doors open, and sometimes ripped off. The house was also incredibly cold all the time. One night, my mum heard lots of crashing, seemingly coming from next door. The dog was barking and she heard the TV turn up incredibly loud, which she believed was Billy turning the TV up to tune out the arguing. She said after the TV had turned off, she heard the familiar knock against her bedroom wall and claimed she could hear an extremely loud female crying through the wall. She said the knocking became more frantic and the crying got louder. And my mum believed that Pat was in serious trouble, so immediately ran out of the house and to next door, where she found the front door of Pat and Billy's house open. The dog was barking in the living room where the door was closed. My mum shouted their names but got no answer and heard no sound. It was as if the house was empty. She had a quick look around and saw Pat and Billy driving up the driveway. My mum freaked out and ran over to say she heard someone in the house to which Billy ran in and started looking around. Pat started freaking out, claiming there was a demon on the staircase. But neither my mum nor Billy could see anything. Billy apparently started walking up the stairs, but only got a few steps up before falling backwards and down the stairs. He claimed he was pushed and they all freaked out and left the house. Allegedly, they mustered the courage to go back in and found the house completely ransacked as usual. They moved in with Pat's mum the next day after packing and started looking for somewhere else to live. My mum claims that shortly after they left, and while the house was still empty, things would get thrown from the windows at her when she was going to her car. My mum also moved out shortly after. Apparently, after Pat and Billy left that house, Billy went back to the gentle giant he was before moving in, and the physical and verbal abuse ceased almost instantaneously. According to Pat, at least, heard the story from all three of them, and it stays the same, so inclined to believe it. Story two, my dad. My dad used to work in a coal mine as a health and safety inspector. One day he and a fella called Geordie were sent to check if any gases or something had leaked in a specific part of the mine, which was rarely ever used. They checked it out, it was all clear. And they started heading back. The miners apparently used to take any opportunity they could if they were out of the way of other miners to have a quick nap. So my dad and Geordie did just that. My dad said he woke up to feel someone poking him. He turned to Geordie and told him to stop. But Geordie was understandably confused. They went back to sleep, but the same thing happened again. Although this time, when my dad woke Geordie up, Geordie started panicking as another light was coming down the tunnel toward them. They couldn't see the people, given how dark it was. Just the helmet lights. However, they thought it was a supervisor coming to check on them and they worried they had overslept. 
My dad said he used one of the phones along the line to ask who had been sent down to check on them and that they were coming back now. The manager claimed that nobody else should be in that section of the mine and that they need to tell them to head back to where they should be. My dad and Geordie started shouting to the person, but apparently the light just started moving toward them at a rapid rate. Apparently a figure zoomed between them. They couldn't make it out, but it was incredibly fast and the light seemed to be from what looked like a helmet. My dad and Geordie apparently spun around to see this figure disappearing down the mine shaft into the darkness. They understandably did a runner back to the supervisors and got ribbed for it. But my dad swears to this day that he saw something down in that mine shaft. Story three, my brother. The last story now, and probably the shortest. When I was a kid, I had a friend called Lewis. He was a family friend, and my dad was good friends with his dad. He ended up moving to a new house, offshoot from a farm. The guy who owned the farmhouse also had a huge barn. He was moving to Spain and had just filled the barn with a ton of junk that he no longer wanted, and it was absolutely filled to the brim there. He told my friend's family that they could help themselves to whatever was in the barn. I was about 11 or 12, and my brother was about 21, 22. Me and Lewis had a route around, and I remember finding a Ouija board, which as a kid, I thought nothing of. Just picked it up, looked at it, and heard about them, but just tossed it to the side. My main interest in the barn was the commando figures and the zoo magazines. For anyone unfamiliar, they were an old porn magazine in the UK before it became easily accessible on the internet. My brother, however, would go into that barn and after his first experience there. He went in once with Lewis. There were two floors, him and Lewis on the top floor and Lewis's dad and my dad and me on the bottom floor. Those two were upstairs when apparently a remote controlled car drove along the floor between the two of them. My brother laughed and picked it up and freaked out because it had no batteries in it. Him and Lewis came down explaining what had happened but the dads just kind of laughed at them. It freaked me out though. After that, my brother would not go into that barn. However, two or three visits later, he claimed he saw a face on the top floor of the barn at the window, staring down at him while he was in the garden. But the rest of us didn't see it. So this happened back in 2006. My entire family got their green cards and after 10 years of being in the States, we wanted to visit home. There was a problem with me. I didn't receive my green card, but a piece of paper saying I was a resident and can come back to the States. This caused another problem. I couldn't go with my mother or little brother, but I think that was just an excuse, but that's for another time. My mother was to go one day and me the next. So I slept over at my uncle's house so he could drive me to the airport. I was 16 and had traveled a lot by this point, so I knew how airports worked. I get to his home the same night my mother leaves to go to the airport. He has a pull out couch, but it was nicer. I was really tired when I got there for some reason. I put my stuff down, put on my PJs and laid in bed. I was out almost immediately. I had a dream, or I hope it was a dream, that I could see myself sleeping on the pull-out couch. I was hovering above my body when I noticed the sheets folded neatly up to my ankles, and I saw and felt myself getting pulled. My arm was under my pillow, and I felt my body being pulled, but I didn't feel anyone touching me. I saw myself moving, and I woke up tired and said, I'm in here only for tonight. I'm leaving the country in the morning, so leave me the fuck alone and let me sleep. You'll get what you want. I assumed it was either a dream or I had a paranormal experience. So to make sure I wasn't messed with again, I said what I said. The reason why I think it was paranormal was because the bottom of my sheets were neatly folded. But by then, it was halfway up my calves. I didn't say anything to anyone in my family because I had a reputation of being a liar. So I knew I would be beating a dead horse with a stick if I said anything. A year later, I hear my uncle and his wife talk about the experiences they've had at their house. They've seen an old man, 
some woman and stuff being moved. Come to find out up a hill by their house is a cemetery. I never said anything to them. I haven't told many people this story because even though it happened to me and I can remember how it looked and felt, I know it's hard to believe. If anyone asks what it looks like when I was floating, everything looked slightly foggy, if that makes sense. A couple of months ago, my husband and I were tasked with packing and cleaning his mother's house. She had already left to go stay with her father, since her husband, my father-in-law, had recently passed away in the house. About three weeks into my stay there, I was cleaning up the kitchen for dinner. The kitchen pretty much was part of the living room, separated by only a bar-like counter. As I was cleaning the counter, I happened to look up, and I noticed a small yellowish orb thing, kind of dancing weirdly up the wall, by the ceiling. I looked outside to see if maybe a passing car's headlights might have been casting a glare, but there was no one and I was home alone right then. A few nights later, as we were just laying down in bed, I had my earplugs in and our two dogs were laying down with us. Right after we turned off the light, I swear I heard three knocks on or near the front door as we were sleeping in the living room. Heart pounding, I sat up and listened through my earplugs, noticing that our two dogs were laying perfectly still with no reaction. I asked my husband if he heard it, and he said no. But for some reason, I just felt scared of that sound, and my heart was pounding. But then, in that tense moment, my husband turns his face to face me, and he says something that I literally responded to with, why can't you be saying this on a bright, sunny day outside, with lots of people around? He said to me, I think I sense a ghost. I didn't say anything. I just squeezed my eyes shut and hoped it would go away. Not even a couple minutes later, he grabbed my arm and whispered urgently that he saw a small yellow orb on the wall below the ceiling, where I'd seen it before. He also told me that the ceiling fan above us had started slowly turning on its own. I didn't see either since my eyes were closed. So I just let it go. But a couple mornings later, we were sitting in the living room discussing the previous events. And I looked up and noticed the ceiling fan slowly turning by itself. I gave an awkward laugh and said that it was probably because of a draft from the heater being on, or maybe an electrical issue. But then, as I said that, the fan stopped and started to slowly turn the opposite direction. The only way to make it do that is by flipping a manual switch on the ceiling fan itself. So, pretty much a no-go in the electrical problem theory. Perhaps maybe a draft from the central heat being on? I don't know. You decide. This story transpired many years ago, when my now 18-year-old daughter was 5 years old. It was never uncommon that after giving my daughter a bath before putting her in bed, for the evening that my wife, myself and my daughter would end up in our bedroom as we got her toweled off in her pyjamas and ready for bed that evening. This night we were all laying in the bed as usual, laughing, talking and catching up as we normally did. Through all the fun and laughter, my daughter stopped and took a serious tone with us. We both asked my daughter, what's the matter? and she's now laying on her back and looking towards the corner ceiling in our bedroom, asked matter-of-fact in a hushed tone, what do angels look like? Neither my wife nor I are very religious, but have grown up with religion in our lives as children and young adults. My wife grew up with Buddhist teachings, and me, Catholic slash Baptist. So we both had knowledge of what the scriptures and texts describe as what angels typically look like, Thinking this is a prime teaching moment, and both me and my wife jump on it. We run down the look of what a classic angel looks like, or form what we know from growing up, that we've been told explicitly that they look like. Beautiful, glowing, wings, dressed in a white and flowing white dress. 
They're kind and loving and are sent to watch over us, to protect us in our times of need. My daughter's eyes never strayed from the corner of the room as we both gave our best description of what we thought an angel looked like and their purpose in our lives. If we're fortunate enough to see one, we both noticed her gaze after our best attempt to provide her with the best information we could muster up concerning her very important question. She points to the corner of the room and ceiling that her eyes have been affixed to and says, they look like that, right? Dumbfounded and a little frightened, my wife and I quickly look to where she's pointing to see nothing. We ask, sweetie, what do you see? She said to both of us, I see an angel right there on the wall. Don't you see her? She's pretty. Utterly shaken, a little frightened and disappointed that me or my wife could not share in the experience she was having. We could not see what it was. She was clearly seeing. And I know I struggled my hardest to try and will this being to show itself to me. I had to explain to my little one that the older we get, sometimes these special things don't allow us to see them because we, adults, may not understand. And if she sees it, then it's perhaps her guardian angel, letting her know they were there watching over her and protecting her, and that it's truly a great thing. After what seemed like ages, but I'm sure it took nothing but a few seconds, my daughter started the angel and was ready for bed. In that moment, as I carried her to bed, I was both grateful and sad. Grateful that she may have been something many of us never get to see. Sad that my eyes could not see this being that my sight had been blinded and shut off from sharing this moment with my daughter because I may be blinded due to age, life and experiences. To this day, I still wish both myself and my wife could have truly seen and experienced that moment with my daughter. Mr. D.H. is a big, burly man's man. I've always known him to be matter of fact and have never taken him for someone easily frightened or prone to emotional outburst. However, this story he relayed to me still haunts me and frankly rocked me to my core. I know for a fact that he believes wholeheartedly the events that took place based on his emotions, facial expressions and the tears that ensued as he told me this story. Mr. D. H. has a long history of heart disease and had been in and out of the hospital for issues and symptoms attributed to this. He wasn't a stranger to the local hospital, or the emergency room doctors and staff, based solely on this medical issue. Mr. DH was rushed to the hospital complaining of terrible chest pains. Once in the ER, he was rushed to the operating room immediately for a triple heart bypass surgical procedure, due to sustaining a massive heart attack and just minutes away from dying. While on the table and being worked on, he did indeed pass away, while doctors were working frantically to save his life. This was confirmed from the medical documentation that he presented to me from the hospital, that eventually saved his life. This is where the story truly takes an odd and numbing turn. Teary-eyed and emotional, Mr. D.H. states that he was hyper-aware that he had expired, died, during the procedure. Trying hard to fight the emotions back and now speaking past a stream of tears, he states, Man, the fucked up part is that I stood in absolute darkness, very much aware of nothing, absolutely nothing around me but darkness, absolute blackness, nothing. As I stood in the blackness which seemed like forever, there was no bright light that everyone talked about. No one came to meet me, no sound, no nothing. As he calmed down some, he went on to state how he remembered the process of returning to his body. Walking up to the operating table past the surgical team, and then immense pain that followed as he was now once again back in his body. He turned, wiped the tears from his eyes, and sadly said, I know now that there is nothing out there for me when I die again. No one will be there for me, and I'm convinced there's nothing out there at all. Nothing but darkness, sadness, and loneliness. I don't want to die again anytime soon. I'm afraid I'll be left out there all alone. I tried my best to bring some comfort to my friend, but what do you say to that? How do you find words to perhaps comfort him? 
I faltered, despite my deep concern for my friend after his major life experience. There really are no words, no explanation, no making right this one man's terrible experience. This incident took place about two months ago. I'm not sure if this is a true paranormal occurrence or a mechanical slash electrical or radio wave glitch. I'll allow you to be the judge. I work for a small medical clinic in Northern California. It's not uncommon for me to reach the clinic before my other co-workers and open the clinic for my co-workers that will be arriving after me. Our clinic has instituted the use of walkie-talkies so that we can keep a tab on each other's whereabouts in case there may be a need for help with a patient or to alert staff when a patient has arrived for their appointment. Per my normal routine, I placed my bag at my desk, proceeded to turn the clinic lights and began checking the clinic to see if any of my other co-workers made it in before me. After checking the back offices and making my way to the front offices, it was clear that I was the first and only person in the office. I had made my way to the front office to grab my walkie-talkie for the day. I turned it on and as usual, there was nothing, but silence on the other end. Nothing as expected. I made my way back to my office and desk, sat at my computer and began going through my paperwork and schedule for the day. Suddenly... Over the walkie-talkie comes a voice that I readily recognise. The voice of my front desk co-worker, whom I had not seen when doing my room and office check for the facility. Over the now crackle, static and increased volume from the previously silent walkie-talkie, I hear the recognisable voice of my co-worker saying, Hello, where are you? After which, the walkie-talkie turns silent once more. Startled now and thinking to myself, How in the hell did I miss hearing someone come through the now only unlocked door in the facility? The door in which my office sits next to. I grabbed the walkie-talkie and holding down the response button said, I'm in my office, when did you get in? There was no response back, just silence. I sat and waited for my co-worker to poke her head in the office. Nothing. I shouted out, hello? Nothing. No sound of movement or noise in the quiet office. No footsteps, no rustling or shuffling of feet. Just absolute quiet. I got up and made my way through the clinic, thinking someone was trying to prank me by pulling a scare on me. And once again, after checking all the rooms, front and back offices, there was nothing or no one there. Just me. Dumbfounded, I made my way back to the office, sat down, and shortly thereafter, the second co-worker arrived. The very one whose voice I had just heard over the walkie-talkie. I ran and met her at the door, asking if she had a walkie-talkie on her, and was using it to scare someone in the office. She proclaimed, no, they're all put up and off, why would I do that? I stated that you called me and asked me where I was at. She looked at me puzzled and said, no, I don't have a walkie-talkie. They're all in the same place where you got yours, all turned off. I checked, and indeed they were all accounted for except for mine, and were all turned off except for the one I had taken earlier. I explained that she contacted me over the walkie-talkie, and I had been going through the clinic trying to find her. She chuckled and called me crazy, and walked onto her desk. I cannot explain what or how it happened, but it was her voice. I recognised it enough to search the clinic looking for her, I know walkie-talkies can pick up other frequencies and people talking on other stations as well as CB chatter, but this voice was specific, one that I recognise. I've been working with this particular co-worker for over eight years now and know her voice. It's sort of ingrained in my brain, but it could not have been her. She was never there. I'm convinced that perhaps it was something in the ether reaching out for me. The chatter over the walkie-talkies is totally recognisable and abrupt. What came over my walkie-talkie that day I opened the clinic was not it. It was truly a calm, recognisable voice, asking where I was. Let me start with a little backstory of myself and recent events, so that you have a detailed picture of what went on in my life, 
that perhaps could lead to this crazy thing I experienced. I'm a 31-year-old house father that's blessed with a beautiful son and daughter and a lovely wife. I'm going through a stressful period of my life. My mother had a rare brain hemorrhage about eight years ago. Brainstem aneurysm in a difficult place. Her chance of survival was 10% and 1% chance that she would survive without any disabilities. Miraculously, she survived and barely has any problems apart from being more direct than usual. This happened at the funeral of my grandma, who passed away in 2013. A few years later, she got a cerebral infraction while she went through the MRI. They also saw a little tumour. However, it appears that tumour is not growing and can't do much bad to her health. A few months later, after all this, my father got a heart attack. He got picked up by an ambulance and they had to do an open heart surgery. This went wrong. The sack where the heart is in was filled with blood. In total, they opened his chest three times in a time span of a week. That was in 2019. They also removed three blood clots. After all this, he felt like a new person and could breathe and move way better for some reason, which is good. Between all of this, I had a business that went bankrupt back in 2016. Barely could afford anything and nearly lost my house. If you sum all this up, I was on quite a roller coaster the last eight years. Okay, now for the crazy thing that I experienced. Due to all these events that happened around me, I started to smoke weed frequently so that in the evening I'm calm and chill. I guess it became a getaway slash under the carpet kind of thing. I was smoking for more than a year almost every day. I'm from the Netherlands, so it's legal here to buy it. I must add to this that my wife didn't know that I was smoking weed almost every day. She knows I'm occasionally smoking, but I was good at concealing it, just like you would expect of an addict. Normally I smoke one gram in two joints per evening. However, you have the option here to buy ready spinned joints in the shop. I bought these, which contain not even 20% of the weed that I normally put in a joint. It contains like 0.1 gram, instead of my usual half a gram. Therefore, what I'm going to write next can't be because you have a very small percentage of THC in one's blood. Anyway, yesterday night, after I went outside to smoke some weed, I came back and started laying on the sofa, playing some FIFA 22. I was all alone since my children were already in bed, and my wife had a little fever, so she went to bed early. I started to feel my heart be raising, to a level that is completely abnormal. I got stabs in my heart and it went to my left arm, exactly the symptoms my father had. I thought I was going to die. While the stabbing became more and more intense, to a moment that I really thought I'm dying, a being or person or thing started to communicate with me through my mind, revealing itself, actually communicating that he, she, it, is questioning if I want to die right now or not. And I had to promise that I would change my life right now, else he would let me die right here, right now. I begged for my life while crying intensely and promised myself unto him, her, it, that I would instantly change myself directly. I also had to go to my wife straight and tell everything, as well as the secret that I'm smoking more than she knows. After I genuinely begged for my life and agreed that this is the end, the old me is dead and the new me will arise. I felt the pressure fading away through my throat. After it faded away, I could feel the energy of everything around me. I could even truly feel the energy of my can of cola and had a feeling I could move it if I could focus enough. However, filled with emotions, I couldn't focus enough. Since I suddenly had a pure connection with my wife's brain, it felt that I had a straight, pure connection line with my wife's brain upstairs. This is the best I can put it into words. I stormed upstairs emotionally, as I felt she felt it too. However, when I came into our bedroom, she was sleeping and woken up by my hysterical behaviour. I felt so awakened, I felt so powerful. I felt like I was way beyond the thinking of a normal person. My wife was of course worried that I really had a heart attack. However, while she was saying this, he, she, it was directly communicated to me. While my wife wanted to call emergency service, that I have nothing to worry about 
and that this was the only way to warn me since I'm a stubborn guy. I was so confused. Still am now. Who is this? What is this? How is this possible? You must realise I've never really seen things or experienced anything like this. I was so scared that I was losing my mind and that I would have to go to a mental institution or something. However, it felt so clear. I can't describe it in words, really. Most people talk with themselves, right? It sometimes really feels like you have someone sitting on your shoulder left and right. I always wondered if that is a second version of me. Or is it like the devil and the angel on different shoulders? Or is it actually someone that is in a different dimension? Or just my mind talking to myself? I don't know if this makes sense, but to me it does. Lately, I'm more and more open to spirituality. I'm more willing to open myself more, and I wanted to start meditating. While I got this heart attack, or whatever it was, while I had these intense stabs, I found out that the one I was talking to for years was real. It was all real. It really scared me. Like a demon was all along with me and wanted to kill me. Sounds weird, but that went through my mind. That's all I could think about at that moment. It was safer, this thought, that the communication started and I had to make the promise. It didn't feel negative anymore. I guess the unknown can be very scary and can make you think it's something negative. When I was explaining everything to my wife, she never doubted me and fully believed what I experienced. While I was in bed with my wife, I tried to focus on who or what it is and where it is so that I could get some answers. You must know I'm not religious. I do believe there's something, which got confirmed to me yesterday night. However, I do not believe in God, Jesus, Buddha, Allah, and so on. But I do know now that there's something higher than that. That's all I can say. Don't ask me how and why. I just know now. Anyway, while I was trying to find out who or what it was, some people crossed my mind, including my grandma. As soon as I thought about her, I could feel her energy. I could communicate. How is this possible? What the fuck? But I was so emotional that I couldn't stop crying, especially when I felt my grandma. I have goosebumps all over my body since this happened to my yesterday. By the way, I did go to the doctor this morning to check if I had to worry about something. However, for some reason, I knew exactly what he would say. Uh, it's probably stress and experienced a panic attack. My wife has had a lot of panic attacks in the past and let me tell you, what I experienced was nothing like a panic attack or anything close to that. Probably I'm forgetting to add stuff here about what I felt etc. However, it feels like it's impossible to explain in words what I experienced last night. My mind still can't comprehend what happened. I'm 22 and an out-of-state college student. I'm just going to get right to the point because, to be honest, I'm kind of freaked out. On Thanksgiving break, I was visiting my parents' house. And while I was the only one awake, I walked to the kitchen to get myself some water. I was Snapchatting with my boyfriend while walking down the hall, about to send a funny picture when I caught something out of the corner of my eye. I saw a shadow of a man about five feet tall, just six feet away from me. As I passed the living room, I shined my light on it and there was nothing there. About a week later, this was later recounted to me by my dad at Christmas, whom I had not told about the Thanksgiving encounter. My sister, her friend and my mom had to run to the store and my dad stayed home. He was watching TV in the living room when he saw a five foot tall figure wearing a hoodie walk from the hallway to the kitchen. He told me it was so realistic he took it for my sister, same weight, wears hoodies, and said, I thought you went with them to the store. He walked into the kitchen and nothing was there. No one was in any bedrooms or the bathroom either. I asked him if it walked like her, heavy footed, and he said no, that it more so glided along its path. Fast forward to now, a little over a month later, and my roommate and I are snowing into our house. My mum calls me and when I greet her, she says my dad is there too. They're quick to spit out asking if I'm okay, what I'm doing. I tell them, yeah, of course, I haven't left the house and we just finished a movie. They tell me that while they and my dog were in the kitchen, 
a wooden plaque my sister made for me with my name on it, and a stick from my university fell into the centre of my bedroom. I think I should note that both of these things have been sitting untouched, securely placed on a shelf in my room, for the better part of two years. I have no clue what's going on here, and if I should be worried for my family or not. Does this sound like something we need to address, or could it be something peaceful? I've had connections like hearing my deceased grandmother's and guardian angel Christmas bells, playing a few years ago when they most certainly weren't, but never seen anything or have things move before this past November. We've lived in this house for almost 20 years. My granny had been fighting cancer on top of other illnesses since I was 15. She always feared when she got old we'd leave her in a home. She and her brothers and sisters always discussed each year who was going to die. And they were always right. And she's been saying for almost three years it was her time to go. We always used to tell her to stop saying that because she was still young. She was going to live for ages. But it almost felt like she knew it was her time to go. She was diagnosed with bone cancer shortly after, and the treatments began. IVs, blood transfusions, chemo. We live in a desert town, smack in the middle of California, so everything is hours away. We used to have to travel hours just to sit to the doctors for maybe 30 minutes and drive back. You can imagine how tiring it would be on someone in such a position. She decided to move a few cities over closer to better hospitals. We were all happy for her. She eventually moved and months later broke the news she was going to have heart valve surgery and deal with the cancer. After her surgery, she came out strong. We were all happy to see her pull through. I remember her calling my name when she got out over the phone. Bubba, where's Bubba? Tell him I love him. Weeks pass, months even, and things start to happen. Seizures, bleeding, random illnesses, she would have constant seizures but always seemed to recover from them. One day, it was different. This time she has a seizure and stroke and was found by my cousin on the floor, barely moving. Black and blue, rushed to the hospital later, finding she suffered from pneumonia. She was in a coma. When she finally opened her eyes, she looked at my cousin and started screaming. Bubba, where is he? When I heard her, I thought there was hope. But eventually, she told the nurses she wanted to die at home. She was moved to her home and not even said later we all planned to see her. But the bad luck ensued and the car broke down. Our money drained. Our family members left without us. We had to watch her suffer from dementia asking who we are. Growing weaker and paler by the day, she eventually passed. But she came to say goodbye to me. Later that night, I went to sleep and appeared in a field of yellow beautiful flowers, with this circle in the middle of it. I assumed it were another vivid dream. I went to the middle of the field dealing every step, and sat down in the middle of this gigantic field. And suddenly, a woman appeared. This big hazel eyes, head to her shoulders, very petite in white shirt and jeans. Something I've never seen in my life. I looked over and saw what I thought were my mom, uncle and cousin. The lady looked directly at me with a smile and said, Tell your mom and everyone I never held anything against you. I love all of you. I'm someone I've never seen. I remember in the dream I was confused, staring at her before saying, I love you too. I'm glad to see you happy. And seconds later she gave me a smile and disappeared. A face full of tears in my dreams. Awaken with a face full of tears, knowing who it was. I told my cousin and she sent a photo of my granny in her high school years. It was her coming back to say goodbye. My granny always knew things a living being shouldn't. She would have severe migraines before a family member passed. And it's always him on the dot. I've always had multiple dreams like these and always thought I was crazy. But it brings me happiness knowing I can still talk to her. This happened way back in 1989 or 1990. 
At the time, I lived in Santa Fe, Texas, and drove my then-boyfriend back and forth to work. It was getting close to sunset, and, as evening is my favourite time of the day, I had parked facing the west, between a low-roofed building and some kind of structure, something like a radio tower with a blinking red light at the top. While drinking my usual coffee, I noticed some movement in the distance. I thought it might be some herons, and became more interested, since I like watching large birds fly. The closer they got, however, the less they looked the birds of any kind. As I watched them come into view, it turned out that what I was looking at wasn't anything living. At least not how we think of things that are flesh and blood. These were just balls. Five chrome balls about three to four feet in diameter. Perfectly round, flying in V formation. They were gliding silently and steadily along. No variation in space or speed in any direction. Just staying the course roughly 50 feet above ground. As they got above the truck I was driving, I sat on the door's window opening and watched as they flew past and right in line with the road behind me. It was so amazing and confusing, I had to resist the almost overwhelming urge to start the truck and follow them to wherever they were going. My eyes never left them except to blink. The entire time watching was spent trying to identify what the hell they were. It's never far from my mind for long, and it drives me crazy sometimes. I've never heard of anything similar. Has anyone experienced anything like that? Anyone in the area that may have seen the same thing? It was around rush hour, so I think there weren't many looking up at the sky. My house is right near a nature reservation, so I see a lot of wildlife throughout the year. Deer, wild turkey, even the occasional bear. However, we've been having really cold weather and snow, and haven't seen a lot of wildlife since. That is, until this morning. I had to work early today, and was leaving the house around 6am, when I noticed something moving around towards the back of the property, where we have a barn about 150 feet back. Right next to the barn was what looked like a large fox making its way across the snow. This wouldn't be that unusual, except for the fact that it was walking through the snow on its hind legs in a super awkward and unnatural looking way. As soon as I spotted the thing, I froze and couldn't look away. The animal kept moving without noticing me and crossed my yard, disappearing behind the neighbor's shed. I immediately got shivers all over and had really bad vibes from the fox. I've never seen anything paranormal before in my life, but the way that fox was moving looked so unnatural that I can't believe it's just a result of injury or something. Definitely going to think twice before walking the dog back there anytime soon. I've seen a few things, but this one is easy to tell. Me and my girlfriend at the time shared an apartment. It was morning and something woke me up. Kind of like when you're asleep and someone walks in the room but doesn't make a sound. But you feel their presence. You know, it's like the air in the room changes. So I woke up and looked to the bedroom door out of reflex. Even though she and I were the only people there and I knew that. Well, no one was there, of course. So I looked at Laura's back. It's around 9.30am, springtime, and we have the sliding door to the patio partially open on our second floor apartment, and we were both naked under the covers, and my glance moved from the doorway to her back, and right then, it was like a clear, wispy shape got up out of her, same size as her, she was really short, put its feet on the floor like you do when you first get out of bed, pushed itself up into a standing position, and then walked straight towards the bathroom. As it's getting close to the bathroom, really only four to five steps, it started kind of dissipating in a kind of shimmery way. Not light shimmery, but kind of fading wispy. Same body type like her, same gait. But I remember specifically thinking it had no hair. And the impression I got at the time was I saw her or a part of her, or her spirit or astral body or something, or a spirit that lived in her, get up and walk away. This was in El Paso, 
and I had several encounters with people who practice Santeria, and a couple encounters with people who practice other forms of magic. So I waited for her to leave for work, and I immediately got down and looked for some eggs or something under the bed. Nothing there. Never brought it up to her. So there it is. Saw a five foot nothing clear sheep get us out of my girlfriend and go to the bathroom. I come from a remote island called Rendover, located in the Solomon Islands, and have since moved overseas. Across from our island is another island, called Tetapare. The story of Tetapare is really interesting, because it was abandoned completely by the inhabitants a few centuries ago. Just like that, the villagers fled the island, to come to neighbouring islands such as my own, and here we're a few centuries later. Because of the lack of humans on the island, it's known for its biodiversity, and a few researchers come every now and again to have a look. The interesting part of Tetapare, for me, was why did everyone just leave? If you were a villager back in the days, it would have been a great place to live. Volcanic soil to grow crops, an abundance of fresh water, animals easy to hunt. The official story told is that there was a great sickness, and people were dropping like flies left and right. So the villagers fled to get away from the sick. However, the island is known to be very big, so realistically, if you wanted to get away from others, it wouldn't be too hard, because you could be self-sufficient on other parts of the islands. The story told to me growing up is a little bit different. Back in those days, we loved to fight. A war canoe from my island, Rendover, arrived on Tetapare to fight. However, upon arrival, they were met with numerous unburied dead bodies. All the large canoes that belonged to the Tetapare people were gone. To leave so hastily and not even bury your dead properly is a really weird thing. Because it was back in the days the first thought was a spirit had done this to these people. However, the people from Rendova decided to set up villages against best judgement. In due time, they also fled because the spirit that had decimated the population of Tetapari apparently attacked the newly set up villages there. Ever since, the island has continued to remain uninhabited, except for the few ecologists that tourists come visit at. Nowadays, we go to Tetapari to maybe have a picnic or go hunting. We are, however, extremely cautious, because it's believed the island is still extremely wild, and because of the lack of humans, spirits run amok on the island. I have some weird stories about going hunting there if anyone wants to hear them, but that can be a story for another time. The island is said to be still wild, because no church has been built on it yet. For this reason, spirits still roam free. Ever since I was small, we went hunting on Tetapari. They have an issue with wild boars destroying the natural habitat, so hunting is encouraged. As a result of chasing boars around the island, I have a pretty good knowledge of where things are. A few years ago when I was younger, while we were hunting, we decided to go visit our other relatives at the Eco Lodge. Recommend visiting it if you want a unique experience. There was a researcher who wanted to go have a look at the unique flora and fauna. Since I was the only one who spoke English somewhat fluently, they told me to take him. We explored the island quite extensively. The thing is, we know when we're hunting, we don't go into the deep rainforest because you may not come out. Simply because of its density, but also because there have been stories of other things. Anyways, I was taking this researcher around and he had a navigational piece of equipment. He was using to see where we were going. The day was nearing the end and I wanted to go walk back to the eco lodge because I didn't want to be camping in the middle of the night without shelter. The way we normally do things is we come back out from the rainforest to the coast to walk to places, simply because we don't want to get lost in the rainforest. Anyways, I knew where we were, and I knew the way to the coast, and told the researcher, let's get going this way. This is where things get weird. 
His device was saying the coast was in a completely different direction from where I knew the direction of the coast was. Now I've heard stories when people go hunting about losing their mind and going straight into the rainforest and never coming back out. At that point, I had to question my own brain because what his device was saying was completely different from what I knew. But I knew at that moment that it may be his device playing up and I didn't want to take the risk of disappearing into the rainforest because of this device. I had walked this forest thousands of times, so I decided to instead trust my gut. I told the researcher that I thought his device was not correct. He didn't like the sound of that at all and tried to argue with me that I was wrong. I knew something was wrong and I didn't want to spend my time arguing and wanted to get out of the area ASAP. So I basically told him, I'm going to go the way I know to the coast. You can follow your device if you want to, but I'm not following you because if you're wrong, we may die. For generations, giants have been at the centre of heaps and stories. From the giants that disrupted villages to the ones that would steal people at night to eat them, we have a ton. Last year, when I was back, I was talking to our spiritual man. They believe our ancestors gave him gifts that connect to the supernatural side. And he told me a more recent story. So apparently, a family from another village had contacted him about their daughter missing to see if it was something supernatural. Now, our spiritual man investigated and came to the conclusion that a giant had taken her. He asked the village if they had a giant population and they verified that they lived in a cave not too far away. So he goes to investigate the cave. From the outside, it looked like a completely normal cave, he said. And when you went inside, nothing looked unusual. But before giving up on the lead, he decided to try a blood sacrifice to see if it would trigger something. He rounded up three pigs and slaughtered them at the front of the cave, pouring their blood out. He said he waited a bit and decided to go in. Sure enough, when he went inside the cave had changed completely and there were stairs leading down. My guy went down the stairs deeper into the cave. He said the plants he saw in the cave were unlike anything he had seen before. He mentioned them glowing in the dark and it was one of the most beautiful things he had ever seen. He eventually went further and further down and sure enough there was a giant on a throne. The giant thanked him for the sacrifice and asked him what he wanted. He mentioned the girl and the giant king knew what he was talking about. He demanded the girl come out and she appeared. The giant explained that one of his family members had taken a liking to her because she was so beautiful and kidnapped her. So my spiritual guy asks for her back and the giant agrees and lets him take her back. She gets returned to her village. And that's all for the story. So the land we live on in my islands is somewhat cursed for anyone who isn't in our tribe or closely related to us. Our ancestors obtained the land through a lot of bloodshed with other tribes. In the time before, there were a lot of other people living on the island, but tribal wars killed quite a bit of the population. People who aren't us or related to us say they feel an extreme feeling of dread when they walk through the bush. To avoid this, my grandmother used to go into the forest herself when a new person came to visit us and talk to our ancestral spirits to say leave them alone. After my grandmother passed away, we forgot to do this and learnt the hard way why we need to still practice the old ways. My cousin had gotten herself a new boyfriend, who we'll call Alan, and they decided to come visit us. Because my grandmother had passed away, no one had gone to the forest to warn our ancestors of his coming. Alan was extremely scared to travel anywhere by himself in our rainforest. He said no matter what, he felt like something was watching him and he had his breath in his throat the whole time. Alan would frequently get chills even when he was sitting next to a fire. One time, we went through the walking through the rainforest with Alan and we came across an old place where we used to sacrifice our enemies to our old gods. 
We all stepped on the stone where they beheaded our enemies, and Alan stepped on the stone and immediately fainted. We took him back to our leaf hut immediately. At that point, everyone figured Alan was just sick, but one night, something made me realise what was actually happening. I woke up to someone tapping me. I thought it was my sister, but I looked and it was a man from before. He was dressed in our traditional clothing from before, and he had a bone through his nose. At this point, I'm completely terrified, but the man says something to calm me down. He says, Ito, which means daughter in our language. I, at this point, realise that this is probably one of our ancestors. He then proceeds to say, who is this man staying with you? I explain that it's my cousin's boyfriend, and he nods. He says he has to go, and walks to the door and completely vanishes. After that, I explained to my uncle what had happened, and he told me that he thought the old ways had died with my grandmother, but it's apparent we still need to practice it for the sake of our guests. After the man visited me and I explained who Alan was, Alan became a lot more comfortable and found the feeling of dread gone. I grew up on this island called Rendova in the Solomon Islands, which was completely isolated due to lack of modern technology. I lived with my grandmother, who was considered to be able to talk to the spirits. Many weird things happened when I was growing up, but this is my most vivid story I remember. We had a little farm to grow our cassava and taro, and my grandmother and I went up nearly every day to work on it and harvest food for dinner. I was only four at the time, but I was my grandmother's little helper. At one point, my grandmother noticed that some of our crops were missing and decided to plant our ancestral ginger there. This ginger, as weird as it sounds, is said to have a demon we used to sacrifice to the inside of it that protects us. She planted it there to ensure whoever was stealing our crops would get caught. One afternoon, we're sitting at our leaf huts and this man comes down from the path of our little farm. He's shivering and is disoriented. My grandmother at this point realised that he was the one who stole our crops and decided to help him and hopefully he'll learn this lesson. She orders me to make a fire and I start making one while she goes and gets the man to sit next to him. He's still shivering next to the fire and so I get blankets and cover him but he's still cold. My grandmother and I sit next to him and she starts talking to him but not talking to him. She says something along the lines of it's time to come out now, leave him alone. I never forget how the man replied. It was the most demonic, low-sounding voice I had heard in my life. And the man replied with, I don't want to come out, he's mine now. So at this point, I'm beyond scared. And my grandmother tells me to go get my uncles to come and hold him down. I go and get them, and they hold the man down in a laying down position. My grandmother then starts doing a pulling motion just above the man's body and he starts screaming. My grandmother keeps going regardless of the scream and repeats the process for about half an hour. Eventually the man collapses and my grandmother says she's got to go into the forest to finish the rest of the ritual. She instructs me to stay with the man till he wakes up and give him some stew, so I do. The man wakes up and is completely confused about where he is. I asked him if he remembers anything and all he said he remembers was intense pain. I send him off on his way back to his home village and my grandmother comes back a little later with a ginger she has to plant. Nevertheless, the man learned his lesson and never stole from us again. This is going back about 10 years ago. I should point out, I seem to be a beacon for the paranormal and have had many experiences in my life. This house was by far the strangest. I live in a low socio-economic city and the rental vacancy rate is usually 1% or lower. So when you need a rental, you kind of just pick a house you don't hate too much and hope for the best. I was living with my mum at the time, my brother, sister and my sister's son. I managed to find a private rental with a lovely couple. 
The house was at the good end of a bad street and was probably about 25 years old at the time. It was quite spacious and modern and was the first house I'd ever rented with an aircon. Fancy. To give a visual idea of the home, it kind of has two fronts, which are both kind of also block backs. On one side, backs onto the start of the highway in cane fields. The other side backs onto a quiet street in a park. The highway side has a fenced yard and a covered patio. The street side has an enclosed but open outdoor space, with another separate enclosed outdoor space that housed the landlord's spa, which we weren't allowed to use. Off this outdoor area was a large kind of fancy garage that could house two cars. Inside that was a door to a tool shed, and inside that was a strange little creepy room that always gave me bad vibes. It had old tools in it. I always tried not to go in there because it just felt too weird. Not long after we moved in, I constantly felt like I was being watched by a young girl, who I always felt was around the spa garage area of the home. I never actually saw her, but it always felt like she was watching me. That was as strange as it got, until a poor little girl was murdered in my city. It seemed to trigger something in the home, I feel. One night, I was in my bedroom and a statue of my shelf flew across the room at crazy speed and hit the wall. It somehow didn't break despite being quite delicate. Then one morning, my then boyfriend dropped me home around 2am. It had been a hectic night studying at uni, so I got home pretty late. I opened the gate to the outdoor area. This is on the quiet side of the house. As the outdoor area wrapped around the house, I could see all the house lights were on in every room. It wasn't too strange a thing, as my mum and brother were total night hawks at the time, and I figured they were both still awake. I put my hand on the doorknob to open it, pushed the door open, and the house was pitch black. When I investigated, my whole family was fast asleep and in their rooms. There's just no way they could have magically turned off all the lights in that split second. I was so baffled that after that I made my boyfriend stay with me as I went into my house every time he dropped me back late. The next experience was when I actually saw a shadow person in my room. I should add, I'd been having dreams about a teenage boy in kinda 80s looking clothes who kept talking to me about his mum in a rather distressed way. He kept showing me a 70s or 80s style sedan in the dream and a gravestone. It got so weird that I asked an old neighbour if there'd ever been a boy killed in a crash, as he always pointed towards one particular road near the nearby cane fields. The neighbour said they didn't remember any such crash. I was again baffled. Enter the shadow dude who I think was the boy. I woke up around 4am and it was only slightly light. I thought my brother was in my room as I saw a thin male figure looking around my room, as if he was looking for something or curious. I immediately said, what are you looking for? The figure turned around, kind of startled, and I could see it wasn't my brother, but a shadowy mass with no real features. He walked out the room, but and this was so creepy. He peeked his head around the door frame once before he walked out towards the lounge room, which is to the opposite side to my brother's room. Just to be sure, I checked my brother's room and he was fast asleep. Eventually, the house was sold and we had to move. This is where all the dots started to connect. I work at a paper and we have history books filled with snippets of old news stories. I read one snippet about an 80s murder-suicide in a town between a mother and her young son and daughter. It was reported in the same suburb, but details were a bit vague, so I wondered if it was linked and forgot all about it. Fast forward a while, and I'm dating a different guy. At one stage, we were driving out near the cane fields in the general area of the house, and we both simultaneously said, Do you feel that? It's like bad energy. We pulled over for a moment and then he said he needed to get out of there and I agreed. I have no idea why my partner at the time was involved in these experiences, but at one stage he was looking for a share house and told me he'd seen this one place that had such bad energy he couldn't stand being there. I asked him details and eventually we found out it was the exact house I had been living in. I hadn't even told him about my time there 
so there's no way he'd have known. So one day, I go looking through microfilm at the library, searching for old history news as we often do flashback stories. I came by the story of the murder-suicide. Turns out it was two doors down from where I lived. The mother is believed to have killed or drugged the children, loaded them into the car, then headed out towards the cane fields where she carried it out. The car in the photo was the exact one that the boy had shown me, and the place it was found was in the direction he had pointed. Their house had been in the same direction that I kept feeling the young girl around. I don't know if they visited the house I lived in. There's every chance they knew the owners at the time and had spent time there. Or perhaps two doors down isn't that far in terms of the spirit world. I did drive back past after I found out to tell the two kids I was sorry for what had happened to them. It also explained why the activity happened after another child was senselessly murdered. I think it upset them to think that it happened to someone else. I've noticed the home seems to change hands a lot. So I'm not sure if everyone there gets haunted or if it's just coincidence. So two nights ago, my grandfather passed away suddenly. Well, it was suddenly to us, but typical John, not wanting to make his business other people's concerns, swore my grandma to secrecy over the last six months and didn't want anyone to know he was sick. My parents' house is currently under construction, important to the story, and he was always coming over all of a sudden, helping out with chores and talking about how he was getting old and doesn't have much time left, but it didn't seem out of character at the time. Anyway, last night I slept in my parents' house with my dog, Harvey. During the construction, my mum and I slept in my room, and my dad slept in the basements. Around 5am, Harvey woke me up, whimpering at the door. He doesn't need to go outside. When he does, he just sits directly on my chest. He was definitely fixated on something, but I eventually got him to go back to bed. Then, I kept hearing the sound of water running in the bathroom. I knew it wasn't my mom who was asleep next to me, and it couldn't have been my dad because there's a bathroom in the basement. I get up around 6am and my dad comes in the kitchen and asks what the hell Harvey was doing this morning. I told him we just got up five minutes ago. The house is open concept, so there's literally one big space that currently only has three patio chairs and a couch covered with a tarp, so it's super echoey and the floors are very creaky. If anyone is walking through there, you can hear it anywhere in the house. My dad walks over to the chairs and starts to rock them back and forth. You were knocking these chairs around like this and moving the couch around. He even knew exactly which chairs made each sound, and then it went on for at least 10 minutes. I explained to him that mom, Harvey and I were all sleeping, and that the chairs and couch were all in the same spot they were in last night. I know because I put them in a formation to create a puppy barrier. I told him I didn't hear anything like that, but I did hear the water running in the bathroom. Then it dawns on him. If someone was up, dog or human, where were their footsteps? For the last 20 years or so, my career has been motor vehicle related. I've held various fleet management and coordination roles with a number of large and or international companies. One such employer was a government department. Around 2005, the UK government decided to set up a dedicated force to patrol England's motorways to keep them hazard free. They were called Highways Agency Traffic Officers, known internally as HATO. We used several sites around the country to train the new traffic officers' defensive driving skills, as well as how to deal with the various situations they would expect to encounter in their new roles. These sites were almost exclusively disused World War II airfields, as we could paint mock motorways on the old runways for the training, and use a hangar to securely store the vehicles in between training sessions. At Throckmorton Airfield, we used Hangar 1. It's a big hangar. We usually had a total of 15 Land Rovers and Nissan Pathfinders located at this site. And even with them all spaced out in the hangar, I reckon we'd only occupied a third of its floor space. I turned up early one morning, between training sessions, to do an inventory of the vehicles and their contents, 
brushes, traffic cones, spill kits, etc. It was barely 6am on a cold March morning. I had a five minute chat with Darren, the airfield manager, to let him know I was on site. Made myself a cup of tea in his office kitchen and jumped back in my car to drive down to Hangar 1. I remember it was raining and light rain. I'd set off from my home in Basingstoke a little after 4.30am and had driven through patches of thick fog most of the way to the airfield. And I especially remember wondering if this was going to be the type of weather I could expect for the rest of the day. I unlocked the big roller doors and rolled one open enough to drive my car in and closed the door behind me. The 15 or so vehicles were lined up against the wall, rears nearest the wall, all facing inwards. I parked up, switched the hangar lights on, grabbed my travel mug of hot tea, priorities, and my clipboard. And for the next 40 minutes or so, set about checking tyre tread depths, lights, and inventorying the contents of the vehicles. I was maybe halfway done with my head in the back of a Pathfinder, counting collapsible signs, when I heard a thick northern accent boom out, okay, give it a try now. My immediate thought was, who the fuck is that? I walk between the vehicles until I'm abreast at the front of the vehicles and can clearly see into the rest of the hangar. Hello? I called out. Nothing. Silence. You know the saying of when the silence is deafening? That's what I experienced at that moment, and it filled me with dread. It scared me. I called out again. Is anybody there? I feel rattled and I don't know why. My gut is screaming at me to run, and I learned at a young age to trust my gut. I sprinted down the row of checkered high-vis SUVs and leaped into my car, stopping only to open the roller door wide enough to get the car out and, wheel spinning on the wet tarmac, hightail it to Darren's office at the gay house. Darren told me a couple of months later at my next visit that when I appeared in his office doorway, I was as white as a sheet and shaking. I remember it somewhat differently. As I remember it, I casually walked into his office and plonked myself on the old sofa in the corner. Darren reckoned he had to take my arm and guide me to the sofa. I do, however, correctly remember his question. Did you see something? Or was it the voice? Darren made me an Irish tea that was heavy on the Irish and told me that a few of the hangers have paranormal tenants. But hangar one was by far the most active. He explained that from what he'd been told during the war, a couple of mechanics were working on an engine of a Wellington bomber. One was up on the wing and the other was underneath, on the ground. The one on the wing said to his mates, okay, try it now. And when the other one tried to spin the prop, the engine caught immediately, which he wasn't expecting. He overbalanced and fell into the now fast spinning blades, which made very short work of him. Darren couldn't explain the malevolence the hangar has, but I wasn't the first to be terrified in Hangar 1. I'm sure there will have been more after me. Unfortunately, I still had a job to do. So after a while, once my nerves had calmed down, I had to drive back and finish my inventory. But you can bet, I kept that roller door open and the engine of my car idling. 